Well, thank you very much for your time. I want to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about why I think behavioural science is so relevant for advertisers. Uh, I wanted to discuss some of the biases that have been discovered by psychologists. I wanted to discuss some of the objections to behavioural science because you might be thinking, look, if this stuff is really as good as some people say it is, why aren't all brands using it? But before getting into the discussion, I thought the best place to start was maybe a more personal story. So how I first became interested in this topic. And unlike most things in life that you just gradually drift into, there was a very specific moment when I first realised the value of behavioural science for brands. And it was in the slightly strange circumstance being stuck in a cab on the way back from what had frankly been a bit of a car crash client meeting. The meeting, which was in 2004, was with the NHS and we had been trying to encourage people to give blood. And the meeting had gone awfully because we were way off our targets. But then on the way back, I was reading a book and at the back of that book, I stumbled across the story of Kitty Genovese. So has anyone heard of the story of Genovese? So you have got one person, any others? Okay, a few people. But for, but for everyone else, Genovese was a bar worker in New York and in the early hours of March the 13th, 1964, she had locked up a bar, driven home to Queens and then uh, parked about 100 yards from her front door. Unfortunately, on the walk to the front door, she was spotted by a man called Winston Mosley. And over a period of about 15 minutes, Mosley stalks, stabs and murders her. Now within a few days this was front page news on the New York Times. Now that might not sound surprising, after all it's a pretty brutal murder, but remember how violent New York was in the 1960s. There were 636 other murders that year and none of them made the front page of the New York Times. The reason this murder made the front page was that supposedly, I do stress supposedly, supposedly there were 37 people who witnessed it and none of them did anything to intervene. So they didn't go down and help, they didn't even call the police. In the Times' opinion, this was just another example of the city going to the dogs. That how could a defenceless person be attacked on the streets of New York despite so many witnesses? But two psychologists Bib Latanay, John Darley, thought that the Times had come to completely the wrong conclusion. It wasn't that no one helped despite there being so many witnesses, it was that no one helped because there were so many witnesses. They argued there was a diffusion of responsibility among the crowd. Now rather than just claiming this from logic alone, the psychologists set up a number of experiments to try and prove their point. They would stage emergencies, so for example, getting a colleague to pretend to have an epileptic fit, and then they would monitor whether strangers came to that colleague's aid. And they set up the emergency so that either they were witnessed by an individual or a group. And their key finding was that people were up to twice as likely to come to a stranger's aid if they were on their own compared to being in a group. Now, if you jump back to 2004, when I first read about this, um, uh, this bias, uh, when we were trying to work with the NHS, you know, this, I thought, was a wake-up call that, you know, bloody hell, we had been falling victim to this bias. You know, we'd been going out and saying, um, asking everyone to donate, and just as Latanay and Dali suggested, most people were ignoring us. Most people were thinking, why should I go through the time, the hassle, the pain of donating, when I know loads of other people have been asked? So recognising that the bystander effect might be a key block, I went and spoke to the creative agency and a lovely strategist down at DLKW called Charlie Snow. I said, look Charlie, why don't we try and tweak the creative? Why don't we stop saying blood stocks are low in England, please donate? And why don't we start saying blood stocks are low in Bermondsey, please donate? Blood stocks are low in uh, Birmingham, please donate? Blood stocks are low in Basildon, please donate? You know, trying to make a slightly more um, tailored uh, appeal to build up that sense of personal responsibility. So it's a very, very simple tweak to the creative. But most importantly, two weeks later, we get the cost response results back. 
and we see they've improved by about 10 or 12 percent. Now that to me was a revelation that this uh, body of work, and remember this was back in 2004, this body of work I felt wasn't being discussed in media agencies, that we were dismissing psychology and other related disciplines as being abstract and otherworldly, you know, not fit for solving commercial problems. But that tiny example suggested to me that maybe we were missing a trick. So I've spent the last 15 years or so trying to immerse myself in the topic and get to uh, know as many behavioural biases as possible and work with brands to apply them. And my argument to brands about why this is such an important topic would essentially be threefold. That this stuff is phenomenally relevant to what we do. You know, on a day-to-day -day basis, brands are trying to get people to pay a premium, to switch from a competitor, to be bought more regular. All of that is behaviour change. So why would you not draw on a 120-year history of the science of behaviour change? What could be more relevant? But relevance isn't the only argument. I think the other big strength is its range. So there's a really worrying trend in marketing at the moment that people are trying to find single solutions to solve all marketing problems, you know, whether that's brand purpose or another kind of flavour of the month. And the danger with having these single approaches is that marketing is far too varied to, um, to have a, a single solution. The danger if you have one approach is that you end up force-fitting the client's uh, individual problem to the single tool that you have. In contrast, behavioural science is much better because it's not a big grand theory you have to subscribe to in its entirety. It's this large, varied body of experiments. And we can pick the bias, pick the experiment, pick the effect that we think is most relevant for our particular client, and then apply, apply that one. And then the final reason, perhaps the most important reason, is the robustness of the discipline. There's still too many decisions in marketing are based on the opinion of the highest paid person in the room or the most eloquent person. Behavioural science is a significant step forward because it's based on the peer-reviewed evidence of some of the leading psychologists from around the world. Whether that's current figures like Kahneman and Thaler or historic figures like Aronson and Skinner. And best of all, all their work is available in the public domain. If we think we've found a psychological insight that is relevant to one of our clients, we can take their methodology and we can rerun it to make sure it works for our particular problem. And I thought it might be useful to just go through a couple of those, uh, a couple of those experiments. Now, when I first started doing these experiments, they were frankly uh, crap uh, because I, I started experimenting on my colleagues. And maybe I should have realised that 20-somethings in a media agency in central London are not necessarily representative of the uh, population of a whole. But that's where I began. And the type of experiment that I used to do, uh, just to give you one example, this was for Armani perfumes. Uh, the type of experiment, I'd set up for Armani a, a stall in the uh, reception one morning, and I'd laid out a load of perfumes. So there was Armani, uh, Calvin Klein, Chanel and a few others. And as people came in, uh, I said to them, look, can you have a smell of these perfumes? Here's Armani, it costs 40 quid. What do you reckon? Rate it out of 10 and put a few adjectives to describe it. And then I moved on to the next perfume, the next perfume, the next perfume. But once about 50 people had done that, waited for the laggards, uh, waited for that, you know, the first group to go and wait for the laggards to arrive, and then did almost the same spiel to them. So that time I said, look, here are these perfumes. Can you uh, rate them? Can you describe what you think? Here's Armani, do this one first. It costs 80 quid from Boots. So not 40 quid, 80 quid. So all the other questions about Chanel, Calvin, uh, Calvin Klein, all that was just a ruse. That data was relevant, chuck that away. What I really wanted to know was how people rated the perfume at different price levels. And what happens is, you know, uh, as in many areas, people experience what they expect to experience. It's not just about smelling the physical or chemical constituents of the perfume. 
So part of that expectation is the brand, part of it's the packaging, but part of it's the price. And as people, when people thought the uh, brand was expensive, they were much more likely to rate it highly. So people were more than twice as likely to rate it seven out of 10. You know, even the adjectives they used to describe it changed. So once we'd got this data, shoddy as it was, went down to see the client and said, look, you're lucky enough to work in a market where it's not your quality that just drives the price, it actually works the other way around as well. Your price drives your perception of quality. So you could apply this in a very literal-minded way. You could just stick your prices up, but that might hit the cold, hard reality of the till. Or you could change how you allocate your budget. Because what they were doing up till then, like most brands, was sticking 99.9% .9 of their budget behind their mass market, main selling, quite reasonably priced perfume. They weren't putting much budget at all behind their Armani Privé that sold for 150 quid. You know, because using logic, it hardly sold any units. So our argument was put loads of your spend, a disproportionate amount, behind your really expensive perfume. We know that price drives perceptions of quality, therefore people will uh, admire your brand as a whole more, therefore you'll end up selling more perfume. So a very, very simple experiment, uh, done quickly, cost almost nothing, and had a very practical output. But as I mentioned, it's hardly scientific to be testing your colleagues. And I'd probably still be testing on my colleagues today if luckily they weren't quite a cynical bunch. And I ran so many of these experiments over the first year or so that my colleagues became deeply suspicious about most things I did. So I would send out genuine meetings to genuine uh, client problems and half the people I emailed would say something like, look shotters, we know there's no bloody meeting, this is one of your silly experiments, can you stop bothering us, some of us have got proper jobs to do. So I polluted my pool of experimental subjects, so I then had to go out into the real world, which luckily for me means I've actually got a reasonable database of valid experiments. And I want to take you through just one more experiment. And this was probably back about 2010. We had quite a few retailers at the time, and one of the dilemmas they had was what to do with contactless terminals. So the issue was, that many of them had introduced them to London. Those terminals had reduced queues, so they're good in one sense, but they were also very expensive. And many brands thought, or many shops thought, uh, you know, that they weren't really worth the price. So they rolled them out in London and hadn't rolled them out elsewhere. But a colleague and I, brilliant researcher called Claire Linford, we thought there might be another reason for introducing these contactless terminals. So we put together a very simple experiment. We went and stood outside little coffee shops and delis in central London, and we uh, tried to stop people and ask them three questions. Now, the key word in that sentence is tried. If any of you have ever done any market research, uh, people in central London do not want to stop out of goodwill and give you five minutes of their time. So the first time we tried this, it was a debacle. Three hours, we got one person stopping out of pity. So then we went back to the office and we started brainstorming uh, what cheap incentive could we give people that would encourage them to stop and talk to us. It had to be cheap. I had no authority to be doing this, so this was all going through expenses. What do you reckon the best thing that we found was, it costs a pound, the best thing for getting people to stop? Any ideas? A cookie? I think, do you know what? Uh, we tried food and drink. People are remarkably suspicious of a slightly dishevelled stranger trying to hand them free food. So that, that did not work. Uh, we tried... Charity donations? We never tried charity donations, actually. That pretty shows my, uh, where my mind goes. Fake police uh, ID? Uh, sorry? Fake police ID? We did not try that either. <laughs> At least I'm not willing to admit that on camera. Uh, the next thing we tried was pound coins. You know, actually handing people free cash in the street is not the best thing either. I think people feel they are being called slightly cheap if they take a <coughs> grubby pound coin. The best thing by far was scratch cards. 
If you give someone a pound scratch card, it is far more effective at stopping someone than a pound coin. Now, I think you're giving them the dream of winning a million quid, not insinuating that they're cheap. So once we'd got our incentive sorted out, went back outside these stores, stopped people, and asked them three questions. How much have you just paid? What means of payment have you used? And can we see your receipt? And so we compared what they thought they'd spent with what they'd actually spent. And there was a very clear pattern. When people were spending with cash, about three quarters knew what they'd spent, but those who didn't overestimate their spend. Credit or debit using chip and pin, two thirds of people knew exactly what they'd spent, but those who didn't were as likely to underestimate as overestimate. And then with contactless, less than half of people could accurately remember, and they tended to underestimate their spend. So we saw this swing of about 15% between memory when spending with cash and memory spending with contactless. So we went back to the retail teams and said, look, you, you know that uh, value from all your tracking is hugely important and getting people to go back to the shop. But if you're going to be pedantic, it's not value that matters, it's memory of value. And you can either change that memory by reducing your prices, but that will decimate your margins, or you introduce contactless terminals, people remember you as good value, and therefore they're more likely to return. So that might sound like an anachronistic finding, pretty much everywhere has contactless terminals these days. But you, it's the, the key point is the underlying principle, and the underlying principle that the same price can be made to appear better or worse value, dependent on how you display it, holds in a remarkable number of circumstances. Over the next few weeks, when you're out at a restaurant, have a look at the menu. Increasingly, restaurants are taking off the pound signs because they're aware of work by, well, they might just do it for design reasons, but they might also be aware of design, um, psychological work by Sybil Yang, who's shown that if you remove the pound signs or dollar signs, people become 8% less price sensitive. You're reducing that pain of payment because you're putting a bit of distance between the delivery of the service and handing over money. So again and again, we see different ways of displaying the same price can uh, change the perception of value. Even as basic as something like a service provider, they can change the unit of time they talk about. I've done work with uh, colleagues where we've shown again and again that if you talk about, let's say, a pound a day as the price, seen as much better value than 365 quid a year or 30 pounds a month. Again, it's like people, or people do put greater emphasis on the uh, cash and too little emphasis on the unit of time. So it's almost like they think six times four is not the same as four times six. But having uh, spent a lot of time uh, talking to brands about these biases, showing them these experiments, what I've tended to find is people come back with the same objections. And I thought it might be worth going through some of those objections and saying why I think they're not valid. And the first objection maybe is one that you're feeling. You might be thinking, well, I don't think I would be affected by those biases. You know, I don't think I would be affected by whether I was paying with contactless or cash. So why would my very sophisticated consumer be affected? But just because our intuition says these tweaks are too small to have an effect, it doesn't mean it's actually the case. And when I first tried to persuade marketers that the tiniest of tweaks could have a large difference, I used lots of academic experiments, lots of case studies. But that didn't seem to affect people. And they still went back to their own intuition. So what I've tried to do is, before I go and see people, I send them a survey, and then I'll go through a couple of questions from that survey and the results will show, hopefully quite clearly, that we're all affected by these biases. So hopefully some of you filled that survey in that Gerald shared. Uh, the results are blended to get a nice big robust sample with other people have asked this week. Um, but I wanted to take you through two quick questions. So the first question was, how good at your job are you compared to your peers? I only gave you two potential answers. You could either say above average or below average. So if there are a statistician here, they would say, look, the answer should be quite obvious. 
roughly 50% will say below, roughly 50% will say above. But of course, if there are psychologists here, they would say that is never going to happen. There is a well-known bias of overconfidence. People predictably think they are better than they actually are. So knowing that, what proportion of you do you think said you were better than your peers at your job? Any guesses? 99%. <laughs> I love your cynicism. It wasn't quite that bad. But uh, <laughs> any, any, uh, so what, uh, any others? 70. 70. Okay, well, kind of split the difference pretty much. 89%. You know, that's certainly not the highest I've ever seen. Uh, I did this the first time I ever did it, so I knew who answered it. I did it at the Newsworks uh, conference. And I thought 96% of them thought they were better than average. So that, that's, the, uh, that's, the kind of, that's the highest benchmark. But it is a, uh, a well-proven study. I would suggest if you hear a finding from someone purported to be interested in psychology, if you hear a finding that seems too good to be true, and there's only one experiment that backs it up, you should be a little sceptical, because it's important these experiments replicate. And overconfidence is one that is a very robust finding. Two of my favourite studies, there's one from Kay Patricia Cross, uh, in which she goes and finds psychology lecturers, and even people who are very well aware of the bias of overconfidence, even 90% of them think they are better lecturers than average. <coughs> there's another study, Svensson, that's slightly more ridiculous, he goes and finds drivers who've been laid up uh, in car accidents. They're still in hospital. And even these people, who are demonstrably bloody awful at driving, even a majority of them think they're better drivers than average. So the point of this is to say, look, we're not necessarily, uh, we don't necessarily have full introspective insight. Our intuitions are not necessarily accurate. Or in the words of a brilliant psychologist called Timothy Wilson, we are strangers to ourselves. So just because you feel these tweaks are too small to influence you, it doesn't mean it's the case. And the second kind of related finding to that is, and this is one of the broader findings of behavioural science and social psychology, it's if we don't have good insight into our genuine motivations, <coughs> as Wilson suggests, and lots of experiments back up, if we aren't able to explain our real reasons for buying a product, why, as an industry, do we still spend hundreds of millions of pounds interpreting quantitative survey data at face value? I think there's a real danger that it, it leads us to believe shoppers are far more logical, rational, and making thought through decisions than they actually are. But that wasn't the only experiment I uh, asked, sorry, the only question I asked. The second question was a bit more of a puzzling one. Uh, it was a question about apples. And the question that time was, how many calories do you think an apple has? More or less than 50. So people had to guess more or less, and then they had to fill in an open text box. And they made a specific guess. And that guess was 75. But, whilst that's a reasonable answer, if anyone purporting to be interested in psychology sends you a survey, you should be a little suspicious. There's always going to be a, a twist. And the twist in this case was only half of you were asked that way. Half were asked, how many calories do you think there are in an apple? More or less than 150. So not 50 like the first time, 150. So most people say less, and then they had to make a specific guess. What do you reckon the average answer in that case was? 100. Not far off at all, 113. So you've got a swing of about 50% about increase based on this tiniest of tweaks. Now psychologists again would say this is completely predictable. There is a very well-known bias called anchoring, discovered by Karner and Tversky in the mid-1970s. And they describe anchoring as the idea that if you throw out a number at the beginning of people's estimates, they cannot but help be influenced by it. And Tversky's argument was, you know, most questions in life are like this Apple one. There isn't a specific answer. What there is, is this zone of reasonable answers. So if you throw out a big number, people know it's too high, so say, take 150 in our case, they know it's too high, but they take it as a starting place and they begin adjusting down. 
and they stop once they hit the zone of the kind of top of that zone of reasonable answers. So in our case, 110, 115. <coughs> but then if people see a low number, like 50 at the beginning, they take that as the starting place, they know it's too low, they adjust upwards, but they only adjust up to the bottom of that zone of reasonable answers. So you get a bizarre situation in which even though everyone knows uh, the number is irrelevant, because they see it at the, at the beginning, because they take it as a starting place, because they don't adjust enough, it affects their final estimate. Now, you may <coughs> be coming up with other objections in your mind. You might be thinking, well, what can we really tell from a slightly artificial survey? Now, you probably weren't paying that much attention when you did the survey, you probably had lots of other things to do, and there was nothing at stake when you did it. So you might be thinking, well, would these biases still have the same effects when shoppers have cash at stake? Now, surely they have a much greater motivation to think things through more logically. But whilst that seems like a reasonable objection, these biases actually have as much effect in the real world as they do in the lab. And perhaps the best way to show that is to think about what is the most effective ad campaign of all time. Now that is a subjective opinion, so over to you. What do you think the most effective ad campaign of all time is? Any guesses? Oh, <laughs> okay, excellent answer. Uh, brilliant answer. So, okay, we've got that one. One more? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, well, um, any others? So got a Gillette. Gillette, okay. So, accepting this is probably only, well, I don't know. Uh, okay, and for, for Gillette, who here has used a Gillette product in the last week? See your hand up. So, you know, considering the margins on it, it's pretty impressive of a penetration. What about an hardest scientific sample I accept? Who voted, uh, who voted leave? Seemingly a very ineffective campaign. Um, but more seriously, great as those campaigns are, great as those campaigns are, I, wanna, I think there's another campaign that is even more effective. So stick your hand up and keep your hand up if you've ever been married. Stick your hand up. Okay. Now, did you buy or receive a diamond ring? Keep your hand up if you did. Okay, has anyone, we should do it the other way around. Has anyone, did anyone not get a diamond ring? One person. One person that's not sure. I bought one. Okay, <laughs> yeah, but there's, there's complications. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> let's, not, let's not dig into this. <laughs> sure. uh, so maybe 50 people answered, well, about 95% of people bought a diamond ring. You know, I would argue that is the most successful ad campaign ever. Because there is nothing natural about getting a diamond for engagement ring. In the 1940s, people were as likely to buy rubies or sapphires or emeralds as they were diamonds. But then in 1947, a brilliant copywriter, Francis Geraghty, working for the NWA agency, writes the line, a diamond is forever for De Beers. And she manages to fuse in people's mind the link between the enduring nature of true love and the durability of the stone. So it's an amazing campaign because people pretty much think there's no other choice. But great as that line is, and it might be one of the best lines ever written in advertising, the Ogilvy ad man Rory Sutherland says, look, it's not even the best line written by De Beers. The best line written by De Beers is one based on anchoring. It's that you should spend a month's salary on your diamond ring. Think how ludicrous that is. Why would you listen to a salesman who has a very strong, very obvious vested interest in selling you something expensively? Yet just as anchoring suggests they throw out the number of a month, people don't quite spend a month's salary, but they adjust up and start spending two or three weeks of their salary on a diamond ring. Now it has made De Beers billions of pounds. But De Beers has been quite a canny company, certainly didn't stop there. In the 1970s, they start going out and saying in their ads, apologies, we've made a slight mistake. We've accidentally been saying you should spend a month's salary. We meant to say you should spend two months' salary. <laughs> and amazingly, just as anchoring suggests, 
People don't quite spend eight weeks, they start spending six or seven. And again, it doesn't stop there. In the 1980s, De Beers launched in Japan. There's no heritage of diamond rings uh, for engagement gifts in Japan. There's no social norm about what to spend. So De Beers go out and say, you should spend three months' salary on your diamond ring. And now the Japanese spend pretty much more than any other country in the world on their engagement rings. Now, that has literally made De Beers billions. In 1939, they were selling $23 million worth of diamonds in the States. By 1979, it was $2.1 billion of diamonds. If you strip out inflation, it's a 19-fold increase in sales. And it's arguably the most effective ad campaign of all time, and it's partially based on a bias. But of course, some of you might be coming up with more objections. Uh, you might be thinking, well, frankly, that stuff was from the 1970s and 1940s. Would it really work today? You know, we've got the internet, all the world's information is available at our fingertips. We've got millennials, surely things are different now. But it's just not true. The fundamentals of human nature are the same as they ever were. And I think the best way to show that is to think about a more recent campaign that has almost been as successful as De Beers. And this recent campaign is based on a bias called price relativity, so it's similar to anchoring, but with a few differences. And price relativity essentially means consumers have no fixed conception of what is good or bad value. Now, they do not walk around mentally computing how much they're prepared to pay per unit of happiness, whether that's for a trainer or a beer. Because that type of cross-category calculation would be ludicrously complex. And what people tend to do is replace a very complex question with a simpler question that is almost as good. And the simpler question in this, this instance is, how much did I pay for something similar? If I'm now being asked to pay more, this new thing is bad value. If I'm now being asked to pay less, this new thing is good value. That should interest marketers because it means that value is relative, not absolute. And so if marketers can change the comparison set, they can change consumers' willingness to pay by orders of magnitude. Many brands have done this in the last 20 years. Red Bull's a great example. Craft beer is an example. But I still think the best example is probably Nespresso. Now, if you think back to when Nespresso launched, if a lesser team than Nestle had done it, I think they'd have launched in something like this. They'd have put their coffee in half kilo bags and then they'd have sold that coffee in Tesco or Sainsbury's. But if they had done so, and, and assuming they charge the same per gram price they do now, how much do you think a 474 gram bag, and a standard bag of coffee, how much do you think that would, that would cost? Any guesses? 20 pounds. 20 pound. I mean, that is a ridiculously large number, but it's not quite ridiculous enough. Any advances on 20? 34. 34. That's a very suspiciously accurate number. 34 <laughs> quid. Brilliant. Uh, so 34 quid. I would argue there is no way on earth any consumer in their right mind would go to Tesco's, take home, you know, push aside a six quid bag of Dow Egberts and take home a 34 pound bag of Nespresso. And it wouldn't just be the case this felt expensive. It's, it would feel so expensive, it'd feel almost morally wrong. But of course, Nespresso didn't do that. They launch in pods. A pod gives you a cup size serving. And as soon as consumers think of cups of coffee, their comparison set is no longer Cafe Direct or Dow Egberts. It's suddenly Costa Coffee or Starbucks. And that makes the 47 pence that Nespresso want for a, a Lungo pod remarkably good value when you compare it to £2.90 that cost one for a flat white. But 47 pence for a pod, £34 for a bag, it's exactly the same per gram price. But one feels a rip-off, one feels a bargain. Again, a company has made billions of pounds from the creative but simple use of a very well-known bias. Now, I wouldn't want to suggest that behavioural science is only of use in those kind of grand moments of launching a diamond ring or launching a, uh, a, a coffee pod. 
Yeah, there are also arguments that it can be used um, for more tactical uh, approaches. So here you've got m and using it, I think. Now they have their offer of dine-in for 10 quid. Now are a couple of microwave meals a good value for 10 quid? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But what I certainly know is 10 quid feels remarkably good value compared to the 50 quid that Pizza Express want if you go uh, for a meal. So by switching that comparison set, they change consumers' willingness to pay. But on to the final objection. Some of you might be thinking, well, maybe I'm affected by these biases, maybe consumers are affected by these biases too. But do we really need behavioural science to get to these ideas? Couldn't we just use common sense and logic? Are we just dressing up this uh, common sense in academic gowns? Now, I think that's a flawed attack for two reasons. Firstly, if all behavioural science was, was this wonderful catalogue and compendium of insights into human nature and it allowed us to get to ideas quicker, that would be a great uh, achievement. But behavioural science is far more than that. It's not just stuff that we could get to logically. There are some very counterintuitive ideas. And I want to take you through one of those counterintuitive ideas now. But before we do it, I want to do a quick live experiment. So it's a live experiment based on the work of a, uh, an Australian called Adam Ferrier. And what I'm going to do is flash up two pictures of some cookies. And all you have to decide is whether you want to eat the one on the left, your left, or the one on the right. Simple? Okay. Okay. So stick, up if you're, stick your hand up if you would prefer to eat the one on the left. Okay. And the right. So you can keep me honest at the back. What, what do you reckon? 80, 20, 75, 25 in favour of the left? Yeah, roughly. So that is in line with population sample. It's a bit more extreme. Uh, Jenny Riddell and I got a nationally representative sample of 626 people. And we asked them which they preferred. 66 plump for the one on the left. Now, if you look at them a bit more closely, you can start to see there isn't a huge amount of difference. The one on the left is the original cookie, rough and flawed. The one on the right has just had those imperfections uh, moved out, removed. It's always slightly an embarrassing chart to present because I was so awful at using PowerPoint, I didn't know how to make it perfectly circular. So I had to get a graphic designer to do this for us. I think this might be the most expensive experiment I've ever run. Uh, <laughs> so please appreciate it. So the point of this is it's one example of showing that if you remove the imperfections from a product, it can become less appealing. Now, there are specific reasons why that might happen in food, but it is not just a finding relevant to food. Back in 1966, this man, Elliot Aronson, a uh, professor of psychology at Harvard University, ran a classic experiment. He recruited a colleague. Uh, he gets his colleague to take part in a quiz. He gives him the answers to the quiz. So the guy gets 92% of the questions right, wins the quiz by miles, looks like a genius. But then as he's leaving, he stands up and he makes a small blunder, what the Americans call a pratfall. So he stands up and he spills a cup of coffee down himself. All of this has been recorded by Aronson, and then Aronson takes that recording and plays it to people. And he plays it in one of two variants. Either they hear the entire incident, great performance and mistake, or just the great performance. Then when Aronson questions people about how appealing the contestant is, people find the contestant who has exhibited the flaw significantly more appealing. So he terms this the pratfall effect, the idea that if you exhibit people or a product exhibit a flaw, they become more appealing. It's certainly not just the case this is a factor of uh, an artificial lab experiment. In 2015, Northwestern ran a huge experiment looking at product reviews. 111,000 product reviews, and they crossed 
the rating of that review, one being awful, five being brilliant, with the likelihood to purchase the product. So they looked at 22 product categories. I've just got one up here, salon hair care, but all the categories showed roughly the same pattern. So as the review gets better, as logic would suggest, likely to purchase uh, increases. But then at some stage between 4.2 and 4.5 out of 5, depending on the category, likely to purchase peaks, and then if the reviews get any better, they begin to decline. So the psychologist argued that consumers thought perfection was too good to be true. They did not trust claims of perfection. Now, if you think back to the history of the most successful ads of all time, it's interesting how many have used this insight. If you just look at the best ones. 1959, DDB, they go out and say, ugly is only skin deep for VW, Beetle. They continue that campaign with a line, Bob Levinson here, they tell people the car is slow. So it's a wonderful line, if you can't read it, it says, you can tell them from Volkswagens, because a VW won't go more than 72 miles an hour, even though the speedometer shows a wildly optimistic top speed of 90. So they told people their cars were slow. Same agency three years later, in a line written by Paula Green for Avis, they say they're unpopular. And Listerine go out and say they taste awful, the taste you hate twice a day. Guinness say they're slow, Stella say they're expensive, cream cakes say they're highly calorific. Again and again, the best advertising admits a weakness. More recently, it's a bit of a trend seemingly in America rather than here, uh, for brands to admit they have poor reviews amongst some people. This is from a, uh, a resort which wants to position itself as for experts with thrilling slopes. So it puts up a review from Greg in Los Angeles. One star. I've heard Snowbird is a tough mountain, but this is ridiculous. I felt like every trail was a steep chute or littered with tree wells. How is anyone supposed to ride in that not fun? Or taking it to the final extreme, you've got work by uh, Hans Brinker Budget Hotel in Amsterdam, in which they go out and say their service is awful. Now what I think these advertisers have realised is that there's three big reasons why you should admit flaws. The first is that consumers do not trust advertising claims. You know, they think that we're either partial with the truth or they might mistakenly think advertisers lie. So by admitting a flaw, you tangibly demonstrate your honesty and then your other claims become more believable. You've got over one of the biggest hurdles in message believability. Secondly, thinking back to that Northwestern data, consumers don't trust perfection. It's too good to be true. They know from bitter experience there are always trade-offs in life. That, and therefore, if you don't go out and say where your flaw is, it's not that consumers think there isn't a flaw. They still think there's a problem. They are just uncertain about where that problem lies. And the danger is they may think it lies somewhere important. So my favourite example, going back into Rory Sutherland, he's argued the pratfall effect is responsible partly for the success of budget airlines. Now think back to when budget airlines launched, it was a very bizarre offering. One day you can fly to Madrid for 100 quid, the next it's 10 quid. If they hadn't gone out and said their service was, service was awful, consumers might have thought the cheap price came at the expense of safety. But by going out and saying how bad the service was, consumers could understand the reason for the cheap price, they felt that deal was fair, and therefore they were happy to fly. But then the third and final reason, I think, is when you look at these greatest brands, you clearly see that they aren't just picking a weakness randomly. They're picking a weakness very, very carefully. They're thinking, what weakness can we use whose mirror strength backs up our core uh, reason? So VW go out and say they're ugly. Their underlying message being, well, we don't care about aesthetic fripperies. We care about engineering excellence. Listerine go out and say, yes, we taste awful. But what would you expect from a potent medicine? Even Hans Brinker Budget Hotel. I think what they're doing is saying, 
yes, we're a dive, but by God, you're going to have a good time. The best brands, again and again, choose a weakness that mirrors their strength. But those, I think, examples should pose a question. If there is so much academic evidence, real world evidence, case study evidence, that flaws are so powerful, why is it that the use of the Prattful effect, this use of admitting flaws, is so vanishingly rare in advertising? Because it's no good just looking at the best before we advertise us. You know, we've gone back to 1959, we've picked a dozen adverts, I'm sure between us we can get a dozen more. But there have been tens of thousands of ads in the intervening 60 years. You know, if you take a more representative sample, I've done this, if you take a representative weekend sample of papers, go through them looking for the pratfall effect, when I did that, if I was very, very loose in my definition of the pratfall effect, I could still only find less than half a percent of ads using it. If I was strict, none of them were. So why is it such a well-proven technique is so ignored? And I think the reason lies in the work of this man, <coughs> Stephen Ross, who's the professor of finance, oh sorry, was the professor of finance at MIT. And Ross has coined a, uh, a finding called the principal agent problem. And it explains a lot of problems in marketing. The principal agent problem is the fact there is a divergence of interest between the principal, that is the business or shareholder, and the agent, that is the marketer or employee. The principal wants long-term, sustainable, profitable growth, whereas the agent, yes, they want that to a degree, but what they also want, unspoken, is safe career progression. And what the practical effect does brilliantly is give you the best chance for the principal. It gives you the best chance of long-term sustainable growth. But what it doesn't necessarily do is give you the best chance of safe career progression. You know, think to some of the examples I went through. Think about Stella Artois. Imagine you were the market director who came up with that. You coined the phrase, or you worked with an agency, coined the phrase, reassuringly expensive. Imagine this alternate universe. You run that, the campaign flops, and any campaign can flop. I think you'd be fired. Because the CEO probably doesn't subscribe to behavioural science, describes some straw man version of economics, and therefore he would think you were a bloody idiot. You told people your product was expensive, of course that dampened demand. But that, to me, makes this the most interesting of biases. Because if we know one thing about advertising, it's that what is distinctive and because of the selfish motivations of agents, this will always be distinctive. We know that what is distinctive is memorable. And therefore, if you can persuade the organisation you're working with to use the pratfall effect, the odds are their competitors won't, because they won't be subscribed to behavioural science, and therefore your advertising can be distinctive in the long term. Now, it's not, to be completely honest, just these uh, business reasons why I love the Prattfall Effect. The other more personal reason is I love presenting about the Prattfall Effect because it essentially gives you a get out of jail free card. Uh, I work with Jamie for ages and he probably knows, well he's seen me on the football pitch, he knows that I'm essentially a bit of a klutz and it's probably a 50-50 chance whether I was going to trip over my books or spill my water in a 45 minute presentation. And the brilliant thing about the Prattfall Effect is you can make any mistake you want, you can forget all the slides, and then you can pretend it was a devious Machiavellian technique to make yourself more appealing. And then the final reason I love this uh, bias is, as mentioned, I've just written uh, a book called the, oh, the Choice Factory, and that has pretty much been a walking example of the practical effect. Everything that can go wrong has gone wrong. So the publisher got the wrong price on the book, so all the books had to go back to the printers again. They didn't manage to get enough stock in time for the launch day, so it sold out and no one could buy the bloody thing. Even stuff that started off very well has had a sting in the tail. So having no advertising budget, what I decided to do to try and promote this was uh, get the book, send it to people I admired, like Dave Trott, or Rory Sutherland, or Steve Harrison, get them to write a nice blurb, and then I sent that to magazines. And I kind of hoped they might write something about it. 
So one of the reviews I got was from Mark Ritson, professor at Melbourne Business School, and he wrote this. If you've ever read his columns, you know he's quite acerbic, so in his style he starts off slagging off other advertisers. He says that they're a cacophony of overstatement and kindly says I have a balanced voice in contrast. So well, that sounds great. I'll send that to some websites and see what publicity I can get. So I sent it to a site called MNAD, which is the New Zealand, and along with others, uh, but they're the New Zealand version of campaign. A couple of days later, I go back to have a, a look at the site, and they had run this. A cacophony <laughs> of overstatement. <laughs> so I, e I emailed the editor and said, Look, I don't quite think that's a fair reflection of the spirit of the quote. <laughs> and he genuinely emailed back and said, oh, we thought it sounded quite good. When English is their first language, what is going on? Uh, what is the state of modern journalism? Uh, so I went home, <coughs> was ranting to my wife about this, the kind of unfairness of it all. And my wife, who's the far cannier of the pair of us, and she's a copywriter, she said, look, there's, there's absolutely no point getting angry. That's not going to do you any good. Why don't you play these people at their own game? Why don't you send me the other reviews you've got, and I'll see what I can do? So I sent my wife some of the reviews. Uh, I sent her one from Martin Sorrell. Martin Sorrell, suspiciously, within about two minutes of receiving an email, said uh, that he will take a look at the book. <laughs> so my wife said, why don't we edit that down and stick it on the front cover? Martin Sorrell says, take a look. <laughs> but to my eternal shame, I am a coward and I thought maybe, you know, I might one day want to move jobs. Uh, you probably should edit that bit. Uh, maybe I want to move jobs one day and perhaps annoying the most powerful man in media was not a good idea. So I didn't run that on the front cover and instead I ran a, a Rory Sutherland quote. It's maybe more appropriate. So I hope that was useful. The key thing I would like to stress though is that is barely scraping the surface of behavioural science. There are literally hundreds of experiments, hundreds of biases identified. Whatever problem, because there is such a range, whatever problem you are facing, there will be a bias that maybe can't quite solve the issue you have, but it will at least give you a different angle and help solve it. Thank you very much.